We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. It is a pleasure to welcome uh, to the program a senior fellow at the Watson Institute at Brown University uh, and author of Poisoner in Chief, Sidney Gottlieb and the CIA, and the Search for Mind Control. Stephen Kinzer, welcome to the program. Good to be with you. Um, so uh, let's let's start, obviously, um, with, well, maybe we should start first with just sort of the 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 broad strokes of the CIA's desire, if you could contextualize, I guess, for us, the, the context in which uh, the CIA came to um, be interested in mind control. This was an amazing project, which ultimately became known as MK Ultra. Uh, Alan Dulles, the head of the CIA, gave it that name because he believed, probably correctly, that if the CIA could find out a way to control people's minds, the prize would be nothing less than global mastery. So it would tower over other successes of the early Cold War, like overthrowing the government of Guatemala or overthrowing the government of Iran. He had this idea also that the Soviets were hot on the trail or that indeed they had already discovered the secret to mind control. So charged with this frenzy, uh, Alan Dulles hired a most interesting guy uh, who uh, was the chief, became the chief chemist of the CIA and also the director of MK Ultra, which under his leadership became the most methodical and farthest reaching and most brutal search for techniques of mind control that have ever been launched uh, in history. All right. And before we get into um, uh, MK Ultra and to, to Sidney Gottlieb, just give us a little sense of, of Alan Dulles. I don't know if people how familiar uh, most folks are with um, the and I think it was one of the he, he was the longest running CIA director, I guess, at this point and um, uh, quite a character in and of himself. Alan Dulles was a towering figure at the CIA. He dominated its early history. He came in uh, near the very beginning. He actually helped draft the bill that created the CIA. And then all during the intense years of the Cold War, he was the CIA director. So it's difficult, of course, to piece together everything that uh, the CIA did. And the story of MK Ultra has only emerged in pieces because many of the records were destroyed in an effort to make sure that none of this ever came out. Alan Dulles, however, we can now say, uh, was obsessed with this idea. He considered it the top priority of the CIA. And that's why he gave Sidney Gottlieb, the director of MK Ultra, what amounted to a license to kill. Uh, in the course of Gottlieb's experiments, he was allowed to requisition human subjects, uh, not just in the United States, but across Europe and in East Asia, where the CIA maintained secret detention centers where MK Ultra experiments were carried out. And these, this network allowed Gottlieb to have essentially uh, uncontrolled power as long as he was carrying out experiments that were aimed at doing something that he thought was a prerequisite to finding the key to mind control. Gottlieb believed, uh, and uh, Alan Dulles allowed him to go in this direction, that before you could find a way to insert a new mind into somebody's brain, you first had to find a way to destroy or blast away the mind that was already in there. So that was the goal of his experiments. And uh, he spent 10 years trying to find ways to use drugs, electroshock, and all kinds of other techniques uh, in, in, so in ways that would allow him to destroy a human mind and a spirit and a body. And, and he did that for 10 years before finally concluding in the end, in the early 1960s, that actually mind control is a myth and the entire search had been fruitless. Um, all right, and, and, and we'll go through some of the, the details of that 10 years, but 
how I, I made, oh, you know, I, I, I'm struck by two two questions. Is is one is like you know why specifically uh, Sidney Gottlieb, and um, two are are there is it possible there are other Sidney Gottliebs out there that we just don't know about? <laughs> uh, well, first of all, you ask why Sidney Gottlieb, and that is a fascinating question because. I truly believe that I have stumbled on the most powerful unknown American of the 20th century. There can't have been anybody else who was allowed the freedom to do the things that he did on his own without really having any supervision at all. So Gottlieb was brought into the CIA as a 32-year-old chemist in 1951, but he was a very different figure from just about everybody else in the top ranks of the early CIA. All of those gentlemen uh, knew each other from the silver spoon background of the same uh, private schools and uh, investment banks and uh, uh, law firms. Gottlieb was different. Uh, he was the parent, son of uh, Orthodox Jewish immigrants in the Bronx. He went to City College. He limped. Uh, he stirred. He was a very different figure from the other CIA officers of that era. And he also had a, a very strange personal life. He, he, the way he lived was probably different from every other uh, federal bureaucrat in uh, 1950s Washington. He, he lived in a little cabin in the woods with no running water. He was into living at peace with the environment. He considered himself a compassionate humanist. He, he grew his own vegetables. He got up before dawn to milk his goats so he could make yogurt. He meditated. So by day, he was carrying out the most intense experiments on human subjects uh, that have ever been conducted by any agency or officer of the U.S. government. And by night, he was living this life of the contemplative of father and husband who lived off the land and were spiritually in touch with all the world around them. So they, he had Jekyll and Hyde thing going in a big way. And your second question, could there be other God leaves? I tell you something, this story is uh, shocking even to me. You know, this, is, this book is my 10th book. But it's the first book I've written that that I'm shocked by. I, I still can't believe that all of this happened. And as I've turned it over in my mind during the years I've been working on this project, naturally, I've asked myself the question that you asked. So if there, if there was a Gottlieb then, think of how much further advanced is the secret world and the, how far uh, further along the technology is, how much vaster is the computer potential. So it would be naive to think that uh, Gottlieb, as the CIA later tried to present him, was just uh, one crazy guy who managed to slip through the net of the CIA that normally makes sure that nothing this extreme happens. There, it's certainly plausible and probable, I would say, that uh, maybe in a generation or two, there'll be somebody exactly like me inter being, uh, having a chat with somebody exactly like you talking about something that's happening, was happening in 2019, but people back then didn't know anything about. Well, and, 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 and to that point, and I want to get to the details of the story that, that, that do make it so shocking. Um, but the, uh, but is it possible that there was other Gottlieb's contemporaneous? Like, I mean, we, you know, we, we know, um, you know, I, I just wonder, like, they didn't do it. You know, they, they certainly tried, right, to cover up all of the existence of this program. I wonder if it's possible that there were others that they just they were more successful with. At the end of uh, Gottlieb's career, uh, he had to appear uh, before a couple of congressional investigator investigating committees. Uh, he was able to do this in private, and he never really had to uh, touch any of the most sensitive things that he had done. However, um, he did complain that uh, in many of the documents with which he was confronted, there were uh, various signatures. All were blacked out, 
uh, and redacted, as they say, except for his. And he kept saying, why, why me? Why am I, why is my signature the only one that nobody ever blacked out when they decided to release these documents? And that, I think, made him uh, reflect back on something we just talked about, which is how different he was, what an outsider he was at the CIA. I think that when the uh, truth of MK Ultra began to come, come out in drips and drabs, the CIA's response was to say, uh, well, as actually, as William Colby, the CIA director, uh, said when asked about this once by some MK Ultra victims, uh, some of our people were out of control in those days. There were problems of supervision. So essentially, this is a way to avoid all institutional responsibility and say, well, it was all Gottlieb's fault. Could there have been others? I don't think there was anybody running a program like this. Uh, because Gottlieb had uh, authority to travel around Europe and East Asia directing experiments like uh, none that have ever been conducted in the U.S. government. So he really was a person who not only carried out these experiments, but conceived the entire program. Wow. And I tell you, one of his favorite drugs, his, actually his all-time favorite drug was LSD, which he himself said he uh, used uh, at least 200 times. And when I read that and I started reflecting on, on how bizarre were some of these horrific experiments that he carried out, I even asked myself, when, when wondering how you could conceive of these experiments, did he conceive of some of them while he was actually using LSD on his favorite drug and then go, his, letting his mind go off in this grotesque direction? Well, let's and let's talk about uh, MK Ultra. So the the it, it sets out he's tasked right um, with this idea of like learn to we want you to learn how to brainwash people, uh, but you know before we can implant ideas in their minds, we have to break them down. So was it his? Did, did he then decide like okay, well then I need to. I'm going to use a, a wide range of techniques to do it. Like, uh, let's go through some of those. I mean, one you've, you've touched on is just like uh, basically dosing people. Um, and uh, but but go through the, the, the lengths in which like how long over the course of those 10 years was LSD like, OK, we're going to start with every patient that we have. Every subject of this experiment is going to get LSD. And then we're going to do other things. Or was it cocktails of, of different drugs? Or, um, what, you know, what was his, I guess, scientific approach? First thing he did was to ask himself, like a good scientist, what research already exists? So who's out there that's already an expert in this field? Uh, and the field is how to destroy a human mind and a soul and a human body and how to use drugs to do that and try to control people. Well, the obvious answer was the Nazi doctors who had carried out experiments in the concentration camps. And those Nazi doctors, along with some of their Japanese counterparts, came to work for MK Ultra projects. Uh, and uh, I tell you, I while doing the research for this book, visited what I think was the first uh, CIA secret prison. It's a, in a beautiful chalet in Germany. And uh, the young German businessman who owns it took me down into the basement. And he said to me, these were the cells in which the MK Ultra doctors and their Nazi counterparts carried out experiments that were just continuations of the experiments that those same Nazi doctors had been carrying out just a few years earlier. Right, this is 1952, Down the right? road, I, exactly. It, We're right in the early 1950s now. Um, so uh, what kinds of experiments were those? So, for example, uh, in uh, that safe house or others like it in Germany, an experiment like this might be carried out. Uh, I found one in which... Uh, People were, uh, the victims would be placed in a uh, sensory deprivation chamber like a uh, coffin and then injected with uh, barbiturates so they would move it, get, fall into a deep coma. Then after a period like that, they would be suddenly injected with overdoses of amphetamines that would make them hyperactive. And while they were in the transition phase between coma and hyperactivity, 
they were given overdoses of electroshock to see if this whole combination delivered at that moment might be something that could destroy a person's mind or kill someone. And in fact, the same uh, German businessman I was telling you about who owns what was then the CIA torture house told me people in the neighborhood, the older residents, have told me that in the forests around here is where they buried uh, the victims uh, who, who were experimented to death. And most of those places are now covered by uh, shopping malls and, and apartment blocks. So those were uh, uh, victims who the uh, CIA documents charmingly call uh, expendables, like refugees who nobody was connected to or suspected enemy agents that the CIA had captured. In East Asia, many of the victims were uh, North Korean prisoners of war. And so Godleave had the right essentially to requisition people uh, to carry out experiments, and then he would go over or send other MK Ultra teams over to carry out these experiments. Now, inside the United States, Gottlieb also carried out experiments, although here he did not have the actual license to kill people uh, because he had what was called in the CIA documents the disposal problem. He didn't have that over in the Philippines or in uh, Korea or Japan or Germany. So he would carry out experiments often in uh, federal prisons uh, for obvious reasons. He, he liked using inmates. Uh, I found one MK Ultra experiment, for example, that was carried out in a federal prison in uh, Kentucky. Uh, in this experiment, seven African-American inmates were segregated into a cell and without being told what was happening to them, were given overdoses of LSD every day for 77 days. The purpose of this experiment was to find out if that amount of LSD over that long period of time could destroy a person's mind. The protocols from that experiment were among the records that have been destroyed and lost, but I strongly suspect that the answer to that experiment question was yes. I, so I believe that I'm sure those people's minds were destroyed, so the experiment would have been a success. What happened to them, who they were, is something I don't think we'll ever know, but it's something I still wonder about every time I, I think about this experiment. So these were all ways that Gottlieb uh, tried to find a way to create a void in uh, a human mind, only to be finally persuaded that you actually cannot ever, for example, make a person go out and commit murder uh, if that person is deeply opposed to murder. It turned out that was a fantasy adapted from fiction uh, and triggered by Cold War fears, but uh, the process of pursuing that fear uh, laid waste to many lives. Is is that what they were looking for? It's like a Manchurian candidate where they can just, you know, uh, or, or, or what was it? Um, uh, the boys from Brazil or Telephone or whatever it was where it's like, you know, we just call up. All I got to do is read a um, uh, is uh, get this guy on the phone and then uh, say a, uh, you know, a poem by Thoreau and they go off and uh, commit uh, some type of espionage or something. Uh yeah, that's certainly one of the uh, goals that uh, Gottlieb was seeking, a way to program a person to commit crimes uh, and then uh, not only forget who had ordered him to commit the crimes, but forget that he'd even committed them right. at all. Uh, they were also looking for other things, for example, a truth serum. How do you get a prisoner to uh, uh, reveal everything that he knows? And in fact, Gottlieb was the author of the first... CIA memo based on his years of experience about how to break down prisoners and make them totally reliant on the interrogator. That document in various uh, different uh, incarnations has gone all the way through Vietnam and Latin America and up to Abu Ghraib and, and Guantanamo. So in a way, MK Ultra has definitely influenced uh, the development of the techniques that we now call enhanced interrogation. Um, have you or has anyone located, you know, I guess 
subjects or victims of this? I mean, I know Whitey Bulger uh, apparently was one of those guys who was was dosed while in prison, right? Um, were, were there were there others? I mean, you couldn't locate those um, um, uh, seven African American prisoners. Um, were there others who who gave like a first hand account to this? I mean, uh, it. it I, I mean, I can only imagine the, 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 the suffering that, that, you know, those, those seven guys went through. The worst of it is that, of course, nobody even knew that MK Ultra existed or that there was some guy from the CIA roaming around America and the rest of the world dosing people with LSD in various ways without their knowledge uh, just to f- observe their reactions. If, and nobody would have believed them if right. uh, they had said so. Uh, so it wasn't until uh, about 20 years after the experiments went on that the first news of them began to trickle out. And then at the beginning, there was uh, a bit of a uh, tr- uh, series of people slowly realizing that this might have been what happened to me. Um and you're right, Whitey Bulger, the famous Boston gangster, was one person uh, who came to this conclusion. He suddenly realized it. So Whitey Bulger's story is just one that we know. You can multiply this by many others. Uh, but it's one of the ways I put my book together by trying to weave in the various stories that we have. So in Whitey Bulger's case, uh, he was a young uh, hoodlum in his mid-20s when he was sent to uh, the Atlanta prison for truck hijacking. There he was approached by one Dr. Pfeiffer, a very eminent figure who was also the chief of uh, a a prominent department at uh, Emory University. Uh, And he was asked to be one of the prisoners participating uh, in an experiment uh, aimed at finding a cure for schizophrenia. If Whitey Bulger were to cooperate, he was told that he would have uh, better treatment in prison and good time and so forth. So uh, he agreed. He didn't know what he was being given. All he knew was it was something that had to do with curing schizophrenia. Well, what it was in the end, it was actually LSD. And he was fed LSD just about every day for more than a year. And later on, he wrote a detailed uh, diary for himself after he got out of prison of what happened and how awful it was and what he used to see in his his prison cell and how since then he's had nightmares every night of his life and he can't sleep. He has to have the lights on at night. Uh, But he didn't say anything to anybody because, as he wrote in his diary, uh, I thought if I said anything, they'd never let me out. But uh, he's just one example. And... Uh, I discovered in uh, one uh, book on Whitey Bulger that at one point in the 1970s, when the news about MK Ultra came out, he realized that that had experiment had nothing to do with schizophrenia. It was a CIA experiment aimed at mind control, and he told the other gangsters the hung out with that he was going to find that Dr. Pfeiffer. He's going to go back to Atlanta and he was going to kill him. Uh, uh, Pfeiffer died a natural death, apparently, uh, not so long after. So Whitey Bulger never carried out that threat. But he's an example of somebody who finally put it all together. But what he didn't know was what was behind Dr. Pfeiffer. And that's because Sidney Gottlieb, at that even then, was totally invisible. And uh, part of the challenge of my book is to r- write a biography of a person who lived in such deep anonymity. Um, tell us about Operation Midnight Climax. Um, <laughs> that is, um, it's quite a name. <laughs> so Gottlieb was interested in trying everything possible that had to do with drugs uh, and see if combinations of drugs with all kinds of other techniques uh, might not help him understand ways to make people talk more freely and uh, open their minds to outside control. At one point, he came up with the idea that he'd like to test the 
uh, effect of mixing sex with drugs. Uh, the question was something like, was there a combination of drugs and sexual techniques that would uh, make men uh, speak more freely or in some way uh, open up their brain to control? So, in pursuit of this highly scientific project, uh, he set up a bordello in uh, San Francisco on Telegraph Hill, and he had uh, an agent, a very colorful a federal narcotics officer, uh, set up a, a ring of prostitutes who brought their clients up to this apartment and then dosed their drinks with LSD or whatever drug it was that Gottlieb wanted to try out that week. And meanwhile, Gottlieb's agent would be sitting on the other side of the one-way mirror on his portable toilet drinking martinis out of a pitcher and writing down what he saw through the mirror. That was the extent of the deep clinical analysis. So uh, in this operation, uh, this uh, CIA-sponsored bordello, uh, which was essentially your tax dollars at work trying to find a way to protect America from communism, was indeed known at the CIA as Operation Midnight Climax and really represents one of the most bizarre extremes of Gottlieb's uh, mind control experiment. Do, I mean, if, so, so if they were aware of this, you know, at the agency, like what, what was the perspective? Like, like this guy's twisted, we're all twisted. I mean, what, I mean, look, the whole thing, put aside the fact that it's, you know, some guys uh, behind a one-way mirror, uh, t um, uh, or two-way mirror, I guess, and, 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 and you know, um, recording this, I mean, what what was their perspective? Was it just like this is a project we're doing? It's going to get a little weird, but we have it at arm's length enough so that we can say this guy's a a, a freak and he just got out of control and he wasn't filing his weekly reports properly or something. You know, you're you're not actually that far off. So uh, at the CIA, I now I realize as I, I was investigating the project that led to this book, uh, there's a certain culture that I think also exists at other secret services, and that is that ignorance is often an asset. You, you don't want to know too much. It implicates you. Uh, so at the CIA, I think there were only a very few people who had an idea uh, of what Godley was doing. Alan Dulles was certainly one. Uh, Richard Helms who was sort of the intermediary between Gottlieb and, and Dulles, uh, was another. Uh, but uh, since those guys, Dulles and Helms in particular, understood that Gottlieb was carrying out this urgent project and that they knew this would involve experiments that would be brutal, that blood was being shed, that people were probably being killed, did not lead them to decide they needed to supervise this right. much more carefully. It led them to the contrary conclusion. Since we know in our heart that these things are happening, we don't want to ask any questions. This is so important, that's why it's called MK Ultra, that the loss of a few lives or a few hundred lives uh, is certainly a small price to pay. Uh, meanwhile, by uh, not asking too many questions, we insulate ourselves and allow ourselves in the future to say we didn't know anything. Uh, so uh, in this way, Gottlieb essentially worked without any supervision. I do think there would have been a mind control project, something like MK Ultra, uh, without uh, Dulles and uh, Gottlieb, but it wouldn't have gone to such crazy extremes. And uh, this is really an example of how far uh, the project was allowed to go based on the misplaced terrors of that aid. So aside from the story being, you know, completely nuts and it being incredibly compelling, what when you when you look back on this chapter uh, chapter, but the entire the entire saga, um, what what is the the the. What are the lessons that you take from it? Are they narrowly tailored to just the, the CIA? Is it about sort of the way that p 
people wash themselves of responsibility? Uh, what, 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 what's the big takeaway? I think that the ultimate justification for committing immoral acts is commitment to a great cause. Patriotism is one of the most transcendent and seductive of all causes. Uh, Gottlieb lived at a time in which uh, he, all Americans were led to believe that we were at the moment of imminent destruction and that therefore any sacrifice was necessary. Uh, in a way, that could be a little bit of a message for us today. We, too, now are being told that we're at a moment of special emergency and our country faces threats. Uh, therefore, uh, although we normally behave according to all international rules and of ethics and morality, uh, because of the emergency we face now, temporarily we have to give up some of our normal virtues and uh, carry out operations in other countries that we might not otherwise have to do, and we have to give up certain civil liberties at home. So it's a danger. I think Gottlieb lost sight of a an elemental moral calculation. You always have to ask yourself, is there an amount of evil you do in the service of what you think is a good cause but that finally begins to outweigh the goodness of the cause? I think Gottlieb lost lost sight of that, and uh, it's a message not to be carried away by uh, the fears of the moment and uh, lose one's bearings by thinking that any sacrifice is now necessary. Once you do that, especially when secret agencies do it, uh, you begin to go down a path in which human life is devalued and so is democracy. Yeah, and it's arguable that uh, Gottlieb made any sacrifices. Uh, it sounds like there was a, the, those sacrifices were offloaded to a lot of people who weren't even aware that they were making them. Uh, the book is Poisoner in Chief, Sidney Gottlieb and the CIA Search for Mind Control. Uh, Stephen Kinzer, thanks so much for your time today. We will put a link to that book at uh, majority.fm. Uh, real pleasure, fascinating story. Great to be with you. Thanks. It might take us. 